There are members of the American Foreign Service and they have written a few documents. One of them has to do with ambassadors. It reads like this. Ambassadorial nominees must possess clearly demonstrated competence to perform their duties of a chief of mission. A chief of mission. Including, to the maximum extent, the practical, the useful knowledge, and the principal language or dialect of the country in which the individual is to serve. They've got to speak the language. And the knowledge and understanding of the history, the culture, the economic and political institutions and the interests of that country and its people. The American Foreign Service has written. I, I really, and I said this at the opening last week when talking about ambassadors to a foreign land, don't want to revisit the political scene over and over. But when I read this statement by the American Foreign Service, I thought, wow, look at that for just a second. They possess clearly demonstrated competency in the language. In the language. Uh, to maximize their extent to be able to practice. Uh, they are to be able to understand, they have the understanding of the history of what's gone on, the culture, the economic and political situations, and the interests of that country and its people. I think that those attributes can be applied to us being ambassadors. Now, you know, I, I know it can be taken too far, but... Do we know the world in which we live? For instance, it is said that somewhere in the neighborhood of three months to one year after somebody becomes a Christian that they have less than five unsaved friends. We so separate that we no longer have the kind of connection that an ambassador should have. This morning, I want to look at a section of 2 Corinthians. I want to look at the section between chapters 3 and 6 for the attributes of an ambassador. What are those characteristics that come out of the Word of God? Now, when I said I'm trying to do too much, the reality is any part of any one of these sections certainly can be a sermon, if not multiple sermons. So let me just explain why I'm doing this. We're doing now, it's actually a five-part series in all of 2 Corinthians, coming up to the first Sunday in February, in which we will introduce Aspire, A-S-P-I-R-E. It's a discipleship book written by Matt Rogers, and uh, we're going to introduce it. Actually, that's our day of prayer. So at the 9 o'clock hour, we'll all be in here together. We'll talk a little bit more about it, but we'll pray a lot more about it. And our discipleship vision for 2019, that's on the February the 3rd. And then on February the 10th, the very next week, Lord willing, Matt Rogers will be with us and he will preach and he will talk to us about making disciples. He's also going to be leading out in the men's retreat. So men, you can go online and you can register for our men's retreat over in Clewiston this year. And Matt Rogers will be there and talking to us more about personal discipleship, uh, personal evangelism and, and discipleship during that time. And then on February the 17th, we will collectively begin going through the book Aspire in our 9 o'clock hour. Our children will be doing it, our students will be doing it, our adults will be doing it. And the particular topic of that Sunday will be the topic, an expositional sermon from the Word of God. And we will spend the next 15 weeks going through the Word of God using the Aspire Discipleship as an outline. And so that's kind of a background. What I'm doing right now is, is, is spurring us on 
to that discipleship through a look, a flyover of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians has a great deal to help us with this idea, and of course, particularly our theme verse that is behind me, 2 Corinthians 5.20, that we are indeed ambassadors. And, and so am I perhaps overusing that word, that phrase, to characterize 2 Corinthians? That's a possibility. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. What we call 2 Corinthians may quite possibly be 4 Corinthians. There are other letters that he cites in here that we don't have. And so the correspondence has probably gone from Ephesus, where he is in Asia Minor, across the Aegean over to Corinth and writing to them maybe multiple of times. We know of 1 Corinthians, if you look at that letter, there seems to be a lot of problems, a lot of challenges going on in that church. Paul continues to get word back. There's even some indication that the word that he gets back was so disturbing that he went over there and he visited Corinth and tried to work things out a little bit. The indication is that he was pretty stern with them. You folks, you need to get in line here. This is not right. This is, these are not good things of a disciple of Jesus Christ. The reason we say that is because we have a, words here in this letter who said... I didn't want to come to you like I came to you before. I, don't, I didn't want to come to you again with that stern word, and so that's why I haven't come. But there seems to be a group of people, somebody, maybe even an individual. When you read through 2 Corinthians chapter two, 1 and 2, you see the singular being used here. I tell him about this. What you have done with and to him is sufficient. And he uses the singular. So there may be a, an individual who's worked his way into the church at Corinth and is causing some challenge, not only from the word of God, but even Paul as a person. He said, well, Paul, he, he, he said he was going to come and he's not going to come back and forth. And, you know, it's beginning to look a little bit like he's a hypocrite. He's not really keeping up with this word. And, and throughout the letter of 2 Corinthians, we actually can detect another accusation and another accusation and another accusation. And it is in this pressure cooker kind of an environment that Paul responds to them and in that response in that response to them I see characteristics somebody gets in your face somebody points a finger at you somebody accuses you of something somebody squeezes you in a certain way and what comes out is the real us I've used that illustration before. We, we Floridians know that the orange that you see in the grocery store is not exactly the, what an orange really looks like on most orange trees. Isn't that right? I know half of you don't know what I'm talking about, but the other half do. Yeah, and we can look at it, and there could be spots and things all over this orange, but we cut into that. Some of us, we like to cut a little hole in the top and mash on it a little bit and just squeeze it back like that and oh sweet stuff but the truth is we don't even know we could cut a hole in the top of that orange and squeeze it around make it all soft and tip it up and go ooh that could be a bad one we don't know what it is until what until we squeeze it the Apostle Paul is being squeezed, and what comes out of him are the attributes of an ambassador, or at least that's the way I'm entitling it today, the attributes of an ambassador. Take a look at 2 Corinthians. I'm going to begin in chapter 2, verse 14. Chapter 2, verse 14. And suggest to you, first of all, that an ambassador will go anywhere and everywhere because he doesn't belong to himself because he's not his own. That's what he wrote to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, you've been bought with a price. You are therefore no longer your own. You don't belong to yourself. And Paul being squeezed, pressure, listening to this, you know, I, I, I must be sweet. Well, not all the time, but for sure. 
these mosquitoes love me. All I got to do is open up the garage, do a little tinkering out there, and they come flooding in. And sometimes I hear them first. You know, you've heard. (laughs) I hear that. Uh, I do that because that's what's going on. You know, that's what, in some extent, that's what's going on in, in 2 Corinthians. Over and over, the things that crop up. Paul's here. There's a, I can't slap this. It'll, you know, that's what's happening. 2 Corinthians 2.14. He's talked about this kind of pressure. Verse 12, I came, I didn't come. I saw Troas, Titus wasn't there. Uh, my spirit was disturbed in me but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere for we are an aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to the one a fragrance from death to death to the other a fragrance from life to life who is sufficient for these things for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word but as men of sincerity as commissioned by God in the sight of God we speak in Christ now I hope that you see the reason why I said okay let's talk about the attributes of an ambassador because that's what he's correcting in this particular passage and it is chock full of great theology But sometimes we can so pull out the magnifying glass and love to talk about the deep theology that's there is that we miss the real point in the context. If we went back into chapter 2, we would hear that, oh, Paul said he was going to come and visit, but he didn't come and visit, did he? I mean, he said yes, but then he did no. Is Paul's yes and no? Is he scattered back and forth? And and so Paul writes here in 2 Corinthians and tells them why he didn't come. He didn't want to come and be harsh with them again. But thanks be to God, what? But thanks be to God that always leads us in triumphal procession. Through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him. Where? Paul's not making a mistake. He's calling upon the sovereignty of God and saying, listen, anywhere and everywhere you go as an ambassador, the gospel of Jesus Christ goes with you. And God always leads us in his triumphal procession. Now, wait a minute, you might say, it's always, when I share the gospel, when I talk to somebody, um, it doesn't always end in what you might call this triumph, this victory that you're looking at. And here I need to call your attention to the context and a little bit of the original background for you to understand what the Apostle Paul is actually saying. Because if it gets your heart, if it does, and many of you might, I don't know, that's condescending. I was about to say, you might want to leave now. Because what's happening here is is that the Apostle Paul is calling upon a part of the culture particularly a part of the Roman culture. And he's saying that Christ always leads us in a triumph or a triumphal procession. What is a triumphal procession? A triumphal procession is a big parade. It's a big parade, and that parade is used for someone who is trying to climb the ladder, the echelon, the political power ladder in the culture and the society of Rome. And so if a young man wants to work his way up, one of the things that he does is he raises enough money to buy himself an army. He gets an army and he takes that army out to some foreign country. He's appointed by the Senate to go tackle this problem or that problem. He goes out there, he fights the enemy, he defeats the enemy, and then he comes back. But he's not allowed to come all the way back home. He's not allowed to bring his army all the way back to Rome. He can bring them back to Italy as long as he stays outside a a border that the Senate has drawn up. 
A Roman general cannot march his army into the city of Rome. This keeps it away from him having too much power. No, what he does is, is he brings his army as far as he can and then he camps them there. And then he himself comes in and speaks to the Senate. And he says to the Senate, I want a parade. I want a triumph. And if the Senate grants him a triumph, if they grant him this parade, then a big hoop to do is made up. And they parade from where the camp is in. Now, not all of his army, just some of it. And in fact, it is very clearly outlined about exactly what is to be done. What's to be done is, is, first of all, wherever he conquered, maybe there's some exotic animals, they come first. After that in the parade, maybe some wagons full of the, the booty that he has collected, gold, silver, or other kinds of treasures come by like that. And then the conquering general comes himself dressed probably in royal purple, his face painted to represent Jupiter, one of their great gods, and he's in a chariot, and in front of him is four white horses. He's got the crown and a scepter in his hand, and bump a bump, and along with him are usually women, sometimes 50, 100 women, throwing petals into the air, flower petals, all, oh, and the people are lined the streets and on the buildings and cheering and doing these kinds of things as this general comes walking. And then immediately after the general is usually one, two, three, whatever's necessary, of the defeated enemy. Of the, this is point number one of five points. Whew, I'm going as fast as I can. comes to these people, the conquered, chained, sometimes riding, sometimes walking, the general or the king of the conquered country. And he leads them in there. Some historians say that once they're all in there, that, um, that they're killed right there on site. Others say, no, they're taken off site and killed. But these people who are walking know that they're heading for their death. Behind them are a smattering of his army who are the victorious warriors and they're, they're saying things to the crowd and they're rising them up like that. Now that's the picture. I had to take a long time. Where's Jesus? Where's Paul? And where does he say you are? You see, Jesus is leading the procession. So you've got that. He's the general. But according to the language that's used in here, you are not the victorious army. You are the one chained like this, walking behind it. Because he has defeated you. Isn't that a strange picture? Isn't that a very, very strange picture? That you are the defeated one. That's the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. You think about that. You think about the Apostle Paul who used to do what? Go around and collect. Did he, if you know your Bible, he collected Christians. He persecuted Christians. He was going his own way. His perspective about what God has done in his life is God has captured me. God has captured me. Moreover, if we paint the full picture, in my opinion, God is in sovereign control of all of them. He's in control of me, who he's captured. He's also in control of his army. He is in control completely. I get that because he says he's leading some life to life. He's leading others death to death. What he's proclaiming here is the great sovereignty of God. As far as Paul is concerned, Paul is saying, I'm one that's been chained like this. I've been captured by Christ. My life is not my own. I tell you whether I come to you or I go over here or I go over there, my life belongs to the Lord my God who has paid the price for me. I was a slave to sin, and now I am a slave to Christ. 
thanks, and it says it's a praise. Thanks be to God that he always leads me. That's a powerful perspective. Oh, you who are doing this, wait a minute, am I going to commend myself to you? Oh, I am not going to commend myself. I'm one who has been chained by Christ. It's not me. That's point number one. This ambassador will go anywhere because he's not his own. Number two, as I quickly try and move, would you stay with me? Would you write these down? Would you look at this? You know, you're going to have an opportunity the 1st of February to sign up as either a goer or a sender. And both are important. Both are important. Okay? You're going to have an opportunity. But when you have that opportunity to sign up, remember this sermon. An ambassador is willing to go anywhere and everywhere because he is not his own. Number two, an ambassador's sufficiency is from God. An ambassador's sufficiency is from God through Christ and of the Spirit. This is over in chapter 3. It goes almost all the way through it. I'm not going to take time. Uh, it begins, are we beginning to commend ourselves? That's a rhetorical question. Or do we need someone to do the, let, do we need somebody to promote us? No, we don't. Now look down at verse 4. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ, in chapter 3, verse 4, through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, again, there's something going on in the church. Remember that little mosquito that's buzzing around there? It appears, and it's a common thread in where Paul has gone, that they keep hearing him say, my grace is sufficient for you. That's what he's going to hammer home in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. My grace is sufficient for you. But what some people, probably Jewish followers, are hearing is, Paul is denigrating, Paul is putting down the law of Moses, the law which was written on stone. And so he says to them, our sufficiency, our confidence is not in what we do, neither is it something that's written in stone, but God's Spirit who is in us and working through us. That's where our sufficiency is and no place else. You see why I call that an attribute of an ambassador? Will we go from this place? Will we come into this place asking God to make us disciples who are making disciples and then go out in the control and power of the flesh? If we do, what will it amount to? An attribute of God, an ambassador of God needs to come to the place where he says, it's not going to happen unless God does it through me. Picking up in verse 7. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters of stone came with such glory and the Israelites could not gaze on Moses' face because of its glory which was being brought to an end read that again which was being brought to an end the law of Moses will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in verse 10, in the case that once had, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all, because the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more was it is permanent have glory sorry about that reading didn't go well but much more will what is permanent have glory since we in verse 12 have such a hope we are very bold not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end but their minds were hardened for to this day when they read the old covenant the same veil remains unlifted. 
because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We're being changed. That's why that is one of our foundational core values in this church. God, change us so that we are sent out as ambassadors to change others, to be transformed. Number three comes in chapter four. An ambassador not only goes anywhere and everywhere, he finds his complete sufficiency in God, but an ambassador practices a ministry of integrity. The truth is the entire letter could be called the letter of integrity. But here I pick out a few things from chapter 4 in his ministry of integrity. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced grace, disgraceful, unhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In the case of the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We are according to our conscience and we lay that conscience in front of you, servants of Christ. We conduct ourselves with integrity. Uh, it's actually in the next passage, but I want to read it because it really says it plainly in verse 13. Since we, have, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believe and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also spoke. Now what is he saying? A little tongue twister, a little mind teaser there, but he says, what we said, we said. What we believed that we said, we said. What we said we believe, we believe. Think about that when you consider being an ambassador. That the world would see that what you say you believe, you do. You go out and you are that kind of an ambassador. Number four. An ambassador focuses on an eternal perspective. Now that I back up to verse 7 of the same chapter, chapter 4. An ambassador focuses on an eternal perspective. Now this is something that I see people have better than other people. Uh, the way it usually comes out is ask somebody a question and the answer that comes back, does it have this eternal perspective? Does it have a future grace? Does it say, in some sense or another, if you can follow me here just a little bit, is the answer that I'm getting coming back dealing with me now in this world? Or does it have something in it inclusive of a future eternal grace with God? Do I see beyond this world? If you ask a question, does a question come back? Does an answer come back that has an eternal perspective to it? I think that's the kind of ambassador. Paul's getting squeezed here. The, the, the gnats are circling. The mosquitoes are causing him trouble. Something bothering him in his spirit. And he says, wait a minute. Let's not lose our eternal perspective. Verse 7. 
but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to life. We who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Wow. Maybe we need a big eraser. I mean, I love its word of God. Don't, you know, don't take my silliness too far. Maybe the words over there ought to just say, we are always being given over to death. <laughs> I'd venture to say you wouldn't see that on any wall in any church. Sign me up. Sign me up. We're always being given over to death. How can he possibly say that? How can I? I mean, that's morbid. How could, how could he have that perspective? Oh, the only way you can have that perspective is if you believe that this life is the temporary one. The next one is the permanent. Always given over, eternal perspective. And number last, number five, an ambassador applies great, great effort to a clear mission in chapter five and following there, verse 11. I could have read so much more. Actually, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to read all the scripture. Buzz, you don't really need to say anything. Just read the word of God. Chapter five, beginning in verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Now, wait a minute. Just stop right there. He goes on, and there's a lot more, but it's there in that verse. It's there in that verse. Wait a minute, Pastor. Just a minute ago, he's like leading his army. He's leading the, the death to death and the life to life, and he's sovereign, and he always leads us in triumph, and God is going to do it, and he does it through us, and all these great things. And then all of a sudden, the Apostle Paul says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade. Why you got to persuade them if you're going to do all the work? And you see the sovereignty of God come in with the responsibility of the human being and to say, we persuade. We take every thought captive and we, we are engaged as an ambassador to go anywhere with the spirit of integrity and the perspective eternality anywhere you say for us to go we will go continuing but what we are is known to God and I hope it is known also to your conscience we are not commending ourselves to you again but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, if we're crazy, if we're crazy, it is not, is it for God? If we are in a right mind, is it for you? For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. Now, I could keep going on, but the point is just right there. And that is that an ambassador, an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, applies great effort to a clear mission. We persuade because it one has died for all. You say, Pastor, I can't do that. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not educated in Greek and Hebrew and theology and... You know, there's just no way I can be an ambassador. 
I, I, I could never do that. One has died so that all might be saved. It, folks. If it's in you, if you have it, then you can persuade, you can talk to other people. An ambassador applies great effort to a clear mission. These are the attributes. Go anywhere, everywhere, proclaiming it. His sufficiency is completely in God. He lives a life and he conducts a ministry of integrity and that he focuses on eternal perspective and he gives great effort to a clear mission. So I, because there's cameras there, turn sideways and I look. Therefore, we are ambassadors in verse 20 of this chapter. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, God, you see the spirit? You see God making his appeal through us? Do you see it? We're ambassadors. These are attributes of an ambassador. Sorry for my back over here. God making his appeal through us, we implore. There's effort there. We implore you. What do we implore you? Be reconciled to God. You are enemies. Paul says, I was an enemy. But he bought me with a price. The price of the blood of Jesus Christ has been paid for absolutely every person. And not just you. There are hundreds, yea, thousands, yea, millions beyond these doors. That as Jesus was sent of the Father, we are sent as ambassadors to trust him completely, but to also use us to apply our greatest effort because the message is oh so very clear. That verse 21 that comes right after it, that we will close with. That verse 21, for our sake he made him, Jesus, made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, the gospel. Pray with me, would you? Lord, I pray that this sober look of the attributes of an ambassador would ring true in our hearts. That we would go in with both eyes wide open. That we would not be one who puts our hand to the plow and then turns around and looks back. But we know that we have been purchased with the price of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that he's given us a clear mission to go and to make these disciples by being an ambassador. I pray that you would work the word of God in us in such a way that we would be changed by it, use that sharper than any two-edged sword to pierce us and to change us and that we might be sent out as ambassadors of Christ to the glory of yourself and the joy of all peoples. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor. Church, would you stand? Let's prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper today as we sing together.